In America's biggest city, there are legends of a monster living right under our feet. I never in my wildest dream thought I would ever see a rat that big. Eyewitnesses say they've seen super rats as big as cats. I've seen, throughout the years, I've seen bigger and bigger rats. Are these urban legends, or are rats evolving into something quite unexpected? Something bigger, smarter, and more aggressive? The rats are just coming out of everywhere. It was, it was really unbelievable. Monster Quest searches for evidence in the forgotten tunnels of a rat-infested underworld. Using a risky technology to find what lurks beneath the streets of New York City. There's definitely traces that something was here. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. New York City is teeming with people and something else. Something that's taking a bite out of the Big Apple. As dusk falls, rats emerge to take possession of the streets and feast on the trash we leave behind. But recent accounts suggest a bigger, tougher, and increasingly fearless super rat is on the loose. I would say a rat about this big, about this big easily. The pound is probably by four and a half to five pounds. It was very intimidating looking, very vicious. But that was the mother of all mothers. The Norway, or brown rat, America's most common rodent species, is typically seven or eight inches long. The super rats are described as being nearly as large as a cat, 20 to 24 inches long from nose to tail, with a voracious appetite and a vicious temperament. I've seen throughout the years that I, I see bigger and bigger rats. After a decade's experience in the pest control business, Sam Soto believes the New York rats are growing. When I first started, the rats, to me, didn't appear to be that big. And now, you know, always saw the alpha rat, the big rat, the guy who was in charge, the dominant one. Uh, he was always pretty big. But now I look at s some situations when I go in and I see, you know, 10, 15 rats, and I see five or six of them that are big rats. Despite numerous sightings, the super rat is unknown to modern science. But prehistoric fossils indicate rodents did once grow to a monstrous size. Most of the extremes that uh, paleontologists are finding are, are back in the fossil record. Dale Kukainen, a rodent ecologist, was impressed by the size of these beasts. You had some huge animals uh, back in, in, the, in prehistoric times, big dragonflies, big salamanders. But the biggest rodent was recently discovered in, in Uruguay, and it was as big as a car. The remains were found in 2004 on the Rio de la Plata coast in the south of Uruguay. Paleontologists realized they had an extraordinary specimen on their hands. They reconstructed the rest of the skull and determined the animal's proportions. There are formulas for every animal, and for most rodents, the head constitutes about 19% of the body size. Using the standard ratio, the body length comes out at almost 10 feet. Its massive incisors would have been a powerful weapon, crucial for defense against saber-toothed cats and 10-foot-high terror birds. The Uruguay giant is long extinct, but over the past 100 years, reports of big rats are on the increase. Could the rat once again be developing into a bigger, more predatory creature? Monster Quest's three-part expedition will focus on the rat-infested alleyways and tunnels of New York City. Steve Duncan, an urban explorer, will probe beneath the city in abandoned tunnels. It's here that a huge hissing specimen was reported by a homeless man. His pathways will be Manhattan's underworld, layers built up throughout the city's history. Bruce Colvin and Dale Kokainen will look for evidence with night vision camera traps and a risky strategy that involves using rats themselves as cameramen. And we'll talk to experts and eyewitnesses, some of whom have seen something that gives them chills.
like this size, 12 inch plotted tails, and uh, it's probably by four and a half to five pounds. Alberto Saldana, a maintenance man on the Upper West Side, first encountered a giant rat right outside his basement apartment. The first time when I saw a rat, all my head come up, you know, was like scared. You know, I said, no, forget it. I gotta be a strong than the rat. I gotta win the land, what you had. Armed with only a hockey stick, Alberto lies in wait as they emerge at night to feed. Then you wait for them every day, 12 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning. They come out when they don't have noise, and then you kill them. I live in the basement. I don't want a rat attack my kid. That's why I don't feel good to kill an animal, but I have to do it. Don't they're going to kill me, so I got to kill them. That's the only way you survive in New York. If there are giant rats in New York, they have plenty of places to hide. The cool thing about this is that uh, we're really only about three blocks from Times Square. Steve Duncan has spent many hours exploring these hidden spots. Now he's heading deep underground, conducting his own search for the big rats in a train tunnel under the avenues of Midtown Manhattan. We're over underneath 10th Avenue and uh, 41st Street right now. So, you know, we're three blocks away from one of the busiest intersections in the entire world, and it's like, you know, it's a tomb down here. Absolutely no one. Deep into the tunnel, he finds signs of life. The residents, human ones, emerge from the shadows. Do you ever see rats down here? Oh, and many rats are here, a lot of rats, especially when I bring some food here. I can bring no food here around here in the food, because when I bring food here, it's so many rats come here from all over the place in the area, yeah. Many times when I, before, when I come in, the first days, because you know, when, when I knew you in the living places like that, so when I bring some food here, a Chinese food here, you know that. Exactly the same day, if yes, yes, a few minutes ago, a big rat like that, jumping, boom, in the table here, man. Yeah, I scared, really. Steve searches for another tunnel dweller, Jose. Hey, Jose! Jose, you around? Jose's been living down here uh, about a half dozen years, and yeah, he, uh, he he's one of those guys who just likes poking around, but he, he's told me a couple times about this, uh, this time when he was uh, up on one of the one of the kind of cliff sides here that make up the side of the tunnel and he found an opening and was kind of trying to peer in and he heard a sound some kind of growl or hiss or something that scared him so much he's never been back in the section of this tunnel again so i'm kind of curious to know what it actually was Stories like Jose's do not convince this Manhattan exterminator. Jack Wyler believes New Yorkers simply like to exaggerate. New York thinks of itself as big in every, every way. And so if there's a rat problem in New York, it's got to be the biggest rat problem. And if there's a X number of rats in New York, it's got to be the most rats of anywhere. New Yorkers take great pride in everything, good and bad. You know, the most muggings, the mo mo most vicious criminals. We're, we got to be number one in everything. But no one's ever caught a rat bigger than, I think 12 inches is the largest ever caught in the history of modern science. And the man who caught it was Dale Kukainen. I currently hold a record for the largest documented Norway rat, and it's in this book. And it says that the largest rat that was documented was a 1.63 pound Norway rat under exceptional conditions, very good diet, uh, lack of competition, low stress. Um, they might get bigger. But perhaps Dale's record is about to be broken. As I was arriving home one day, I parked my car and I was walking to my apartment. This picture was taken in October 2007 by George Smith in downtown San Francisco. I got very close to home and I stumbled on this thing that was lying on the road. When I looked at it closer, it ended up being this gigantic, disgusting, dead rat. 
and it was essentially about the size of my knapsack, so maybe two, two and a half feet. And uh, so I, I took my cell phone and uh, I took a photograph of it. Is George's picture proof that a Norway rat can grow into a giant? Well, this photo purports to show a rat that's two to two and a half feet long. Now, this looks like a Norway rat. He might be bloated from the sun. He might have been uh, run over and squashed. And the problem is there's really nothing in the photo to give it any scale. I wish people would just think to throw down a quarter or something to, to allow you to determine how big the object is in the picture. Sam Soto believes George might have found a big rat. It looks like it's bloated, possibly from having eaten poison. Uh, the dropping tells me that it's more than likely a Norway rat, but what size is it? Who knows? Could it be big? Yes, it could be a big rat. The modern American city is the perfect place for rats to thrive and survive and perhaps evolve into monsters. In many respects, the Norway rat is better adapted to our cities and people themselves. Bruce Colvin is an expert on rat habitat and rodent control. And when I look at New York City, I look at extreme habitat for this animal. That means infrastructure, old infrastructure, congestion, lots of refuse placed out on sidewalks and plastic bags at night, great feeding habitat. This restaurant in Greenwich Village made the headlines in 2007 when rats were filmed running freely around the floor at night. I don't think I would eat here again. Honestly. Uh, the, the food is good, but at the same time, I wouldn't trust it. And nowhere is safe from rat infestation, even Manhattan's most upscale neighborhoods. The idea that rats are associated with low income areas is a myth. Rats are associated with locations where there's food sources available. It's going to be better fed, high class restaurants, high class garbage. Dale and Bruce have decades of rat experience between them, advising cities on rodent control and inventing techniques to deal with them. Now they have come to New York, willing to put accepted scientific wisdom to the test. Any rat that reaches a pound is exceptional. In our experience, now New York may be growing them bigger. That's what we'll have to see. They choose their target neighborhood carefully, taking into account population, food sources, and current infestations. Well, the reports that are coming in from the people who work in the area suggest lower Manhattan, which we, we already know has more rat complaints than other parts of, of some of the boroughs. There's some older areas here and some streets, uh, the Ann Street, Fulton Street, and some of the alleys off those areas. Uh, it's an older neighborhood, and there have been reports of rats running around, so that's what we're gonna try to focus on. Dale and Bruce will use infrared cameras to see down pitch black rat holes and survey darkened alleyways. They'll mount wireless cameras on wild rats, a world first, in an attempt to infiltrate a giant rat colony. The key to this technology is going to be finding something that is streamlined, something that's lightweight, that can go with the rat down into a borrowed system. Remember, this is a borrowing animal. First, they need to trap rats, live ones. This is not as easy as it sounds. The feel the rats and sizers bite into your finger. It's right to the bone and it, the pressure is incredible. Dale and Bruce head off to the hunting grounds of Lower Manhattan, where they may not have long to wait to find their monster. Big rats have always been a part of society's collective fear. They scare even the most experienced exterminator. They'll skeeve you out. I mean, they skeeve me out. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. Rats. What do they want from us? Rats. Why are they man's enemy? Rats. They are watching and waiting. Are the reports of giant rats influenced by an instinctive fear of the rodent? 
Human beings, I, I think, are, number one, there's a genetic kind of hard wiring about rats, the, the same way we have with certain kinds of insects. We're, we're wired to be afraid of them, of rodents. Rats figure in our horror movies, in our ghost stories. And finally, there are urban legends about giant rats, about rats that eat, uh, bite the toes and fingers of children as they sleep, rats sucking the breath out of babies, things like that. And we, we just perpetuate that fear. We have good reason to be afraid. Rats are indirectly responsible for the death of over 30 million people. In the Middle Ages, uh, the bubonic plague wiped out a third of humanity. It was initially felt that the plague was caused by rats, but in fact, it was caused by the fleas that lived on the rats. So when you lose a third of your uh, human beings, you're gonna remember that for a long time. Especially when some of our worst fears become real and the legends turn out to be true, as one family in Kansas City found out in 2007. A baby girl is in hospital tonight with severe rat bites. All you can do right now is pray. I mean, she's seven weeks old. The attack is a gruesome reminder that we share our city with a rodent that is capable of squeezing through a hole the size of a quarter and chewing its way through pretty much anything. In a city of this size of New York, there are probably between two and 500 rat bites reported every year. And I think nationally between 10 and 15,000. And it often is children because the rats are out at night when the children are sleeping. And they may be attracted to, to food crumbs. The rat will come up and start to feed on that and he may actually bite. It has even been known for an entire pack of rats to attack en masse. In 1979, tugboat workers in New York City went on strike, preventing the barges from carting off the garbage from Manhattan Island. On Ann Street, just a few blocks from Wall Street and the World Trade Center, the rats were making the most of a rising tide of fresh trash. It was during this time that one local man witnessed an extraordinary midday attack. This woman in back of me when I turned around was screaming. Steve Jordan remembers that the rats seemed to be working together as a pack. I could see that there were about uh, five, six, seven rats uh, jumping on her and only her, and crawling on her clothes. As soon as she started screaming, some men uh, rushed down, and they, they started hitting the rats off her with newspapers that were rolled up. And the rats retreated over this nine-foot wall uh, into the big pit. Uh, the police were called. They cordoned off the area. And for the next week or two, exterminators came in with billy clubs and rat poison, went in here. They would toss out sacks, uh, burlap sacks full of dead rat bodies. There's a run here, going right underneath this 30 tent. years later, the quest for a super rat brings Dale Korkainen and Bruce Colvin to the very same alleyway. You can see how smooth it is. The, the remains of dead rats demonstrate the violent life of a New York colony. Could a big rat be the culprit? We can see an animal has chewed into the back of this rat, and it was more than likely another rat. Getting a little extra protein for his evening meal. Looks like the uh, skeleton of a rat right there that other rats are trying to drag under that piece of plywood over there. A second alleyway just two blocks away looks even more promising. Look at this hole here. Oh, yeah. No doubt. Rat activity there. Dumpster is open. Dumpster lid's open. There's some rat droppings right here. That's a nice run right there. Yeah, great edge habitat for rats to move through this area. And then about 35, 40 feet, they'll look at the piles of refuse. Right. Incredible. Great food source. And all that food's going to grow big rats. They need to trap some good-sized rats that can bear the weight of the wireless cameras. So I've got some chocolate and a piece of carrot. There you go. Put it well back here behind the treadle. 
and set the trap. And the rack comes in, door goes down. That's what we hope to find. Several traps are laid and baited. Specially coated tracking mats will capture the paw prints, and the size of the prints will show the size of the animal. Finally, infrared camera traps are used to survey the area. They'll take one picture a minute for the next 24 hours. As soon as the light fades, the rats come out to play. We just heard our first squealing rats establishing territory. Right. They're out and about. They're starting to move. People activity's dying down. The rat activity's coming up. We already picked up a footprint on the tracking tile. It's the first direct evidence that large rats are in the alleyway. This is a big rat. Oh, yeah. Footprint there. No other footprints. OK, he was moving. He, he was really once. moving. As Bruce and Dale continue their quest, a train tunnel beneath the city is home to a man with some horrifying tales to tell. At nighttime, there's a lot of them. There's a whole lot of them. New York City may be breeding a new kind of super rat. History shows they'll be extremely tough to eradicate. Rats are so resilient they can survive a nuclear blast, as Dale Kukainen witnessed firsthand. I was on one of the teams of the people that went back to the Marshall Islands after the atomic testing program. Was recorded on Elliman, a port of entry. In the 1950s, the American military exploded 67 nuclear bombs in and around these Pacific Islands, equivalent in power to 7,000 Hiroshimas. This is by no means a light weapon, since it weighs 43,000 pounds. When we went in, we were on islands where all the soil had been vaporized, the trees had been vaporized, but the rats went underground. They went in the bunkers where the test equipment was and down in their burrows. And they did very well. They survived, and a few insects survived. Everything else was basically vaporized. In more recent times, rats are proving their resilience by developing a resistance to modern rat poison. We found resistant rats in over 40 cities in the United States. And if that animal can survive and then breed, you might be left with only you know, more super rats. Sam Soto, a New York City exterminator, has his work cut out for him. The worst, I'd have to say, it was it was last year um, in Upper Manhattan. There had to be uh, more than a hundred rats in uh, the basement, and the rats were just coming out of everywhere. It was un it was really unbelievable. They they're coming right up to you, like uh, you know, what are you doing in my house? <laughs> What are you doing in my room? Get out. Um, very bold, very bold. Now he's on the trail of some very unusual specimens that could give hints as to the future evolution okay. of the New York rat. There's a dropping all the way in the back there. So we know for a fact that they're back here somewhere. And it looks pretty fresh. He believes that he's found some kind of mutant or hybrid rat, and he wants to take them alive. Perfect. Well, we got a complaint of uh, rats in a basement, and uh, it was the first time I ever went into this building. And when I got into the basement, I saw uh, white rats, white and black rats, mixed in with the black rats, and I found it strange. I went upstairs as a pet shop on the ground level and find out that they, a year before, had rats for the snakes they would feed the snakes these white rats. Somehow, they must have gotten loose. Well, if we can capture them, uh, then we'll know more. But Sam's pet store hybrids are proving difficult to trap. We did spot the white rat that was down there. Um, he's elusive. We didn't catch her, capture him yet. We're, we're still after that guy. And we're gonna go back in and set some more traps. Sam's search continues, while down beneath 10th Avenue, Steve Duncan tracks down Jose, a longtime tunnel resident whose stories are the stuff 
of nightmares. Jose, what, uh, you've been down here like a good five years. What, uh, what rats have you seen? These are huge, very huge. And at nighttime, they will come, you know, matter of fact, they walk all, they walk on you. Yeah, they sniff on you and all that. If you got your finger sticking out or your toe sticking out, they might take a bite out of that. They might take a bite out of that. That's why I get the 110 proof ammonia. They don't come around. And what was the biggest rat he ever saw? I think it was the mother of all mothers. It was like this long, about maybe that thick. And the tail was like that and about that thick. It had red eyes. And he actually stood up on that rail on the, on, the tra on the track and dared me to cross that. That's a big rat. That's something that you... Uh, probably capture and take it to the zoo. You were wandering around in that tunnel where Greg lives now, and uh, you found that, that cave or something on the side? I was looking around and all that, like I normally do, and um, I climbed up the hill, and there was like a hole, like a door in the wall. Without the door, it was like a hole in the wall. So I, when I got up there, it was a growl, I'm talking about it wasn't a human, it wasn't no dog, it was like very, it was like a growl, like a bear or something. Man, I took off down the hill, never went back there again, never. That was scary. As a matter of fact, I, think, I still feel it, I still feel it now. What is this giant beast that Jose describes? Is it a rat or some other animal? Using Jose's direction, Steve sets off to find the hole. Well, let's take a look this morning, see what we have. Yeah. Bruce and Dale return to the alleyways. They're hoping some big New York rats have wandered into the traps. Hey, the trap sprung. It sprung? Oh, we got one. We got one here. Let's see. It's like a male. Like a male. Yep. About nine ounces. An advertising dog. Looks healthy. Okay. Time lapse pictures from the camera traps will reveal the night's rodent activity. At first, there's little to see. We know there's a hole in the back entry area going into that. There is hold one. it right there. We have he's one going, right there. I bet he's going for that hole. There they are, right there. Yep. The people activity died down at approximately 11.10, and there we have two rats. 11.19, degrees Fahrenheit. That's a big one. Look at those glowing eyes. In those pictures, we clearly saw uh, an alpha male. In terms of the size of the animal, I think we also probably saw some very large females. The rats appear to be 8 to 10 inches in body length. Rats spend most of their time in complex rat burrows, which extend several feet under the ground. Bruce and Dale use a specially designed infrared camera to see deep into the burrow system. The reception looks good. All set? All set. Just talk me through. All right. See anything starting to run no. at me? Let me know. Now, well, can you keep going forward? These rats could be anywhere within 10 feet of my arm, or right next to my arm. I'm going forward now. They know there are big rats down there. Can they infiltrate the colony? Hold it right there a minute. I think I see something. location for them. The Monster Quest expedition is on the trail of a new breed of New York super rat. Big, bold, and belligerent. To the right, a little. Eyewitness accounts from the trenches of World War I suggest that rats can even develop a taste for human flesh. Soldiers reported huge rats that would devour corpses on the battlefield. 
I saw some rats running from under the dead men's great coats. Enormous rats, fat with human flesh. My heart pounded as we edged towards one of the bodies. His helmet had rolled off. The man displayed a grimacing face, stripped of flesh, the skull bare, the eyes devoured, and from the yawning mouth leapt a rat. Rats even attacked the wounded as well as the dead. The rats were huge. They were so big, they would eat a wounded man if he couldn't defend himself. The new front line is in the basements of New York City. Gino Rodriguez is a building manager in Manhattan. He has seen super rats clamber up into homes through a toilet, an urban myth that is all too real. <laughs> A uh, tenant called me, and uh, she stated she had a rat in her toilet. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll be up to take care of it. Not a problem, you know. I'm sure. I'm sure it must have fallen in. She says you need to come now. I'll, I'll take care of it. It's not a problem. She says no. You don't understand. There's a rat in my toilet. So I came by to her apartment. I opened up the lid, <laughs> and to my surprise, it was a giant rat. It was a huge rat. So they'd actually try to jump out but it, it hit like the, the underside of the inside of the ball and then just it froze and looked at me. <laughs> I first tried to flush it back down the bowl, but it, it didn't go down it. It wasn't going there. It just took a nice shower. And, um, but I came back with a baseball bat and uh, pretty much whacked them. Gino's rat managed to climb an impressive 50 feet. It's a fifth floor walk-up building and it pretty much went up to the drain line. And if you follow the pipe, the rat somehow just started, you know, making his way up and up the stack. Seating. Down in Lower Manhattan, Bruce and Dale are hoping to catch a glimpse of the rats down in their burrows using infrared cameras. These rats prove to be camera shy. Oh, well, oh, that's what's that right there? Oh, that's your, that's your arm. <laughs> but with several rats already trapped from the previous night, they head back to headquarters to analyze their catch. All right, what have we got? Here goes. We got him. Okay, I'll try Let me to get the body length. Out here. The body length uh, minus the tail is eight inches and five eighths. This is a full-size adult male rat. It is overall in generally good health. And giving, try to bite. And trying to bite now. It's 380 grams, mm. minus the bag. I think what we have is a representative group, typical of any back alley in America. Are they big enough to attempt the next stage, attaching the rat cams and infiltrating the burrows of the super rat? Mounting the cameras on the rats will require some specialist help. Hi, John. John Chapin, a neuroscientist at the State University of New York, has experience that will prove crucial to the expedition. Well, we have, over several years, have discovered methods of putting cameras on rats, and not only cameras, uh, backpacks with radios and video uh, transmitters and that sort of thing. Uh, and we've found that it works quite well. Uh, the problem, of, of course, is that uh, those okay. were lab rats. And here, we're going to be using feral wild rats. They may or not be quite as sanguine about that. So we're going to see what we can do. The team decides the only way to attach the cameras without causing any discomfort is to anesthetize the rats. Well, what we found is that the rat does seem to be able to wear the harness. That's the good part. The bad part is that it's too loose and the camera is too heavy. So the rat is, is trying to lug this very heavy object around with it. Uh, in fact, it's falling off of the rat. They try again with a tighter harness and a smaller redesigned battery pack. You see he's breathing. Now he's, he's coming back. Yeah. His breathing has just picked up dramatically. Here he comes.
In downtown Manhattan, the team is ready to set the rat loose with an infrared camera attached. They are hoping it will show us the darkened rat underworld and perhaps a glimpse of a giant. It's breaking up right now. Chapin's team, Levon Krauss and Shao Zhu, test the wireless reception. They fence the rat in so it can recover without being attacked by other rats. The battery pack for the camera is still too heavy, and the rat does not seem eager to move. They need to find another way. The team decides to feed the power down a long wire tether. It's a much lighter camera. I think he's going to be better. The rat cam is finally let loose in the alleyway. <laughs> there he goes. Here he comes. At last, they get to see the world from the rat's point of view and a chance to meet a Manhattan monster. Meanwhile, down in the tunnel, Steve Duncan finds a rat hole fit for a giant. In prehistory, rodents evolved into 1,000-pound beasts the size of a car. Scientists say the Norway rat does not get bigger than a pound and a half. But is New York home to a new breed of outsized, aggressive monster rats? This man is found and killed rats weighing up to five pounds in an Upper West Side basement. This man, who makes his home in an underground train tunnel, regularly sees rats the size of cats. This man witnessed a vicious attack by a pack of rats just three blocks from Wall Street. As Bruce, Dale, and the Monster Quest team send off a Trojan rat, complete with rat cam, into a lower Manhattan alleyway, Urban explorer Steve Duncan is searching for Jose's growling monster, possibly a large and aggressive rat-like creature. The caves and crevices under 10th Avenue make a perfect hiding spot. So what you have is just, you know, you have all these multiple layers where they tear down an old building and you have the foundation of the old building still left and they build something new on top of it. So that's how you get these like little multi-level nooks and crannies. They are prompt territory for giant scary rats because they are close to the surface and, you know, basically inaccessible space to humans. Keeps on going. There's kind of this crevice underneath the wall over here and I can see it opens up. Okay, so I think I'm underneath one of the older building foundations here right now. And, uh, uh, to my right over here, the tunnel kind of gets narrower. It goes around to the in a, in a curve. It's too narrow for me to easily pass through. But I see it opens up again, and there's a little pile of trash, kind of food containers and stuff. Looks like they've been hauled over there. And then right over here is about a six-inch diameter hole that goes upwards and past the concrete, looking like a rat hole. So this may have been the hole that Jose was talking about. There are so many niches, it's really hard to tell. But uh, if so, there's no trace of the giant thing that he, uh, that he heard, but uh, there's definitely traces that something was here. So what was Jose's monster? Was it the giant rat or something else? Well, I, I think most likely it was probably a possum or a raccoon or something. I don't know. I've seen rats that, that are actually pretty bold and that are terrifying. So. I don't know, if it was a group of rats or a family of rats, I couldn't totally imagine, you know, uh, uh, a, a big old angry rat wanting to defend her brood and making some sort of terrifying sound. And not only that, but I can imagine that in a kind of confined space, a big rat would actually be a pretty tough enemy to, uh, <laughs> to try to deal with. Steve's search must come to an end. Jose's growling monster could still be out there.
But what about Sam Soto's black and white hybrid? This mystery is about to be solved. He finally succeeds in trapping the rat. I've never seen a white and black rat. It's, it looks like a pinto, looks like a cow, like a miniature cow. <laughs> Dale and Bruce confirm Sam's diagnosis. It's a highly unusual hybrid of wild and domestic rat. It may look like, an, like a domesticated rat, and it, it has some pet rat heredity. But it clearly does not have the same adapted traits as a purebred wild rat. A wild rat, a fully wild rat by this moment, would have leaped off my hand. And with a little bit of work, this rat would tame down again. You could socialize him so that he could be handled perhaps without gloves. He seemed to, to kind of welcome coming back into human society and, and, and leaving his own uh, rat colony. So I'm going to take him home for a pet. Got that right there. there he goes. Here he comes. Back in lower Manhattan, the team sends the rat cam off into the alleyway, hoping to catch a glimpse of a giant. There he is, right there. You can see him right there on the pallet. A typical uh, rat behavior, hiding, blending in. I think the rat is on a tether, and so it's, it may have been caught up in it. But they didn't take into account the agility of wild rats. It eventually wriggles free of the harness. The rat got snagged on some garbage behind the dumpster, and it managed to use that snag as leverage to sneak out of its uh, backpack. And uh, then we weren't able to recapture it. So it's hanging out somewhere under the dumpster right now. The team tries one more time. They send another rat, with camera attached, down into the rat hole beneath the city street. There he goes. OK, be ready with slack. We're not getting a good signal. And I can tell you why. Rat slipped the, the backpack. Here's the camera. Goodbye, rat. <laughs> it doesn't stay down there for long. Hey, he's coming back up. He's coming back up, man. Holy crap. The rat is seemingly chased back out by something. There he is. Is that a different rat? That's a different rat. Look at this. He's driving all the rats out. There he is. There's another rat. As the rainstorm breaks, the team takes cover and reviews the footage from the rat cam. You, you, can, you can sort of see the, uh, uh, like the wall uh, that, the, that the rat is walking down through. And, and this is probably the area where we were wondering about where, where the rat went. Even after close examination of the footage, there is no sign of a super rat. Perhaps they need to go deeper into the rat underworld. But uh, like there's it, for example, uh, that's the habitat of the rat. This is the first time that rat cam on the back of a rat has been used. I don't think that it's very easy to put a camera on the back of a, of a rat and then have it go down into the bowels of the earth without uh, the camera falling off. So remote capability, streamlining, lightweight, that's the way it would uh, have to go in the future. But that was a good first try. Well, for me, you know, I see rats run from a distance. I see them in a trap where you can pick them up and look at them. For me, the thrill was getting some vision of a rat's world. We're going to try again. We're going to try to get the smaller, smaller cameras, but we'll figure out a way to do that. With inconclusive results, the search for the giant will continue. Jack Wyler is not convinced it will ever be found. You're never going to find a New York super rat because there isn't one. I don't think there's a secret rat enclave somewhere in New York that lets them out periodically to uh, scare New Yorkers. I think that the fact of the matter is is that we exaggerate because we're afraid. And, and that's why we see rats as big as small dogs. They're definitely out there. You know, you, you, if you stop uh, quite a few New Yorkers and ask them about them, they'll tell you that they've seen these, uh, these rats. <laughs> There's no other place like New York, and the rats know it.
It is a creature that haunts Ohio children in their nightmares. Don't go out of the yard or the grass men will get you. It lurks in the tall grasses, and it's huge. It's hard to explain how it made me feel. I mean, I had nightmares after. The evidence abounds. Strange nests, a print that must be analyzed. Bizarre nocturnal recordings. I know the creatures in the area. That wasn't something I'm familiar with. And an image captured on video of something so stealthy it wasn't even noticed. It's pretty clear that it's an upright walking animal. Science explores the probability putting evidence under the microscope and taking the search for the grass man to new heights. Some type of a signature right there, yeah. down near the ground, the way it looks. I'm not sure what it is. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Ohio. The Buckeye State, known for its heavy industry and home to more than 11 million people. But there is also a rural and wild side to the state. Eastern Ohio, a place where eyewitnesses have long told stories of a creature that evokes the fear of a bogeyman. But these monster tales may be rooted in a real creature that eyewitnesses continue to report. They call it the grass man. It had long... Uh, flowing hair around its shoulders and something came up over the ridge black broad shoulders it was a, a massive uh, individual it did walk under a limb that uh, later on we measured at 10 feet high it's typically described as human-like because of the fact that it's walking up right on two legs you know he's shaped like a linebacker with a broad shoulders broad back uh, no neck small head you know up into the neck area very large muscular arms very long arms most eyewitnesses describe the grass man as seven to eight feet tall, walking upright with broad shoulders and black to brownish hair. The creature is also said to have a very muscular build with large hands and feet. How old is he that? Reports of the grass man date back as far as 1869. On January 23rd in Galea County, a man and his daughter were enjoying a stroll when a wild man leapt at the father. After a long and violent struggle between the man and the beast, the daughter picked up a rock and threw it at the creature, striking it in the head, allowing the man and his daughter to escape. They describe the creature as gigantic in size, with burning eyes and being covered in hair. In the book A Buckeye Boyhood, William Venable described a gorilla-like creature that was particularly fond of the taste of cowardly blood. Its fearsome aggression became legend. It was used to sort of uh, warn children. You would say to your children, uh, don't go out of the yard or the grass men will get you. Christopher Murphy is a historian and author who has documented the many Grassman accounts. He says the accounts all describe a strange, unknown primate. It is the same thing as the Sasquatch or the Bigfoot, although it has some different characteristics. And generally speaking, it is an ape-like, man-like creature, stands over six feet tall, covered in hair, that has been seen a lot in Ohio. The European people, when they came here, they saw them. They figured they were some kind of a native. They were in the grass. So they got the name Grassmen. While stories of an ape-like creature roaming the forests of Ohio seem improbable, there is lots of evidence to be analyzed. The first time I saw it, it was laying upright like this. And that's when I thought it was a dog at first. One such piece is a skull that doesn't seem to belong in Ohio. Jody Cook found it in 2006. And I went into an area um, where I saw uh, a lot of buzzards, and there were some buzzards up on the roost area. So I decided to go up, up on the hillside there, and I noticed on one of the roosts there was a skull. The buzzards suggest that whatever it was had died recently. Cook has seen the skulls of bears, cats, coyotes, and says this is different. To learn more, he sent the skull to primatologist Esteban Sarmiento in New York. It's been cut at or, or eaten by something because it's missing most of the, the brow ridge. 
and part of the upper nose. Sarmiento has over 30 years of experience as a primatologist and is familiar with the skulls of most known primates. It looks like it was really a wild African animal by, by the bony deposition. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I would think this would have had to have been transported from Africa. It doesn't take long for Sarmiento to come to a conclusion. It's a male baboon. That's what it is. But how could a baboon's skull find its way to eastern Ohio? What are the reasons that people bring in animals? We have circuses, we have zoos, we have medical research. Sarmiento has also heard the grass band stories and says a baboon does not look like what eyewitnesses are describing. They don't walk on two legs. Sometimes when they feed, they stand on two legs around bushes. Far away, it'd be a dog. I don't think there's anything else they could be mistaken for. At roughly three to four feet high, a baboon is much shorter than the grass man descriptions of seven to eight feet tall. To many, the grass man looks more like a Bigfoot, a description that conforms to the turn of the century reports as well as modern day accounts. Dream Elkins lives in Pleasant City, Ohio, 85 miles east of Columbus, the capital. Her home is in a rural wooded area, regularly visited by local wildlife. But in 1996, she claims something else paid her a visit. Good girl. Good girl. So I was here by myself. I had gone to bed uh, somewhere about 10, 10.30 that night, I guess. When I woke up and, and I looked at my dog, um, she was looking towards those windows. The first thing I thought was there was somebody was trying to break into my house because there was a figure in the window making the same growling noises that my dog was making, but then it would sniff the air. Eventually, Elkins worked up the courage to get a closer look. Whatever possessed me to get out of bed, I got up and I came towards the window and it turned and walked off towards my shed. And it was down to my shed within five or six steps. But when I got to the window, it turned around and looked back at me. It was at this point she claims she could clearly see the creature's face. It had big wide shoulders and I could see its eyes. It had big wide set eyes and it had a wide nose and it had a big mouth. For amateur researchers like Jody Cook, the Elkins account is just the tip of the iceberg. Cook claims to have found even more evidence that an unknown primate inhabits eastern Ohio. Yeah, we found a sheltered area. Um, it was more like an igloo. It was completely hollow on the inside. On February 19th, 1995, Cook and two other men were investigating some recent sightings outside of Akron. What they found was unlike anything they had seen before. These three photographs taken by Cook show what he refers to as a possible primate nest or shelter. The structure was very unique in the way it was, just, it was formed. Uh, the branches, the grass and everything was interwoven. Uh, it took some time to, to do this. The nest measured 10 feet long and about three feet wide, hollow on the inside with enough room to fit three adult men. The way they're constructed, it was interwoven perfectly like, like you're, you're building a quilt. It was the best way to describe it. it. It was just done very creatively. The foundation was constructed of large branches with smaller branches woven in between. It appears to be covered with long grass and other forest material to provide protection from the elements. Return trips to the area for additional research proved unsuccessful. Actually, we uh, went back on two different occasions to uh, look, but the area is just so overgrown with um, large grass, weeds and stuff, it was very hard to find. Um, the second time we went up there, and it's been completely mowed down in that area, so there was actually no structure there at all. Have not ever seen it again. Jody Cook has decided to join with researcher Don Keating in a search for answers to this Ohio mystery. Their plan? To obtain and examine the best existing grass man evidence and to search for nests and new clues in an area very able to support a creature like grass man. 
The baboon skull, the nests, and over a dozen eyewitness sightings all have been discovered within a region coined the Sasquatch Triangle. Within that area, the researchers have focused their expedition in Salt Fork State Park. You've got 20 to 25,000 acres of water and land combined. Uh, you're nestled in the hills of eastern Ohio on the foothills of the Alleghenies. There's plenty of area around here for anything like that to be roaming and not be detected for quite some time. Don Keating is chairman of the Eastern Ohio Bigfoot Investigation Center. He says what makes Salt Fork stand out above all are the potential hiding spots for grass man. Salt Fork State Park, uh, it's the largest state park in Ohio. Uh, you have a lot of uh, opportunity for a Bigfoot or any other animal to exist off the land. Um, there's just plenty of food, water, and shelter out here. And if you've got those natural resources, and you do, uh, then anything can exist out here. Joining the team are Chris Bergen and Greg Alderman, bringing a new perspective to the search for Grassman. They will explore the wilderness from above with radio-controlled helicopters equipped with high definition and thermal cameras. These helicopters are used for uh, military, for law enforcement, uh, SWAT teams. The military is using them for surveillance purposes, for carrying uh, some radar equipment for testing. Bergen is owner of Bergen RC Helicopters in Michigan. He's been brought to Ohio by MonsterQuest to fly his custom helicopters above the park in an effort to find evidence of Grassman. The plan is simple. Since sightings in the area indicate that Grassman is a nocturnal animal, the first flight is intended to familiarize Bergen with the area and identify possible habitat or hiding areas. Bergen will then relaunch at night using a quieter battery-operated helicopter fitted with a thermal camera to detect any heat signatures on the ground. I'm going to put the helicopter up as high as I can comfortably, uh, keeping it within sight and keeping it hopefully below the turbulent air coming across the top of the trees. And uh, we'll try and keep it as smooth and steady as possible and see what kind of pictures we get. The camera mount includes a video downlink system with a little white box under the front of it. So the person that's operating the camera can see um, what the camera sees through a uh, monitor on the ground. It's up to the camera operator to verify the shot to keep it on target. The mount does include a gyro to help stabilize in the tilt axis only, but we have full control in pan and tilt. If we hard mount the camera to the helicopter, if the helicopter vibrates, the camera vibrates. Camera vibrates yeah. So we're basically soft mounting. I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna fly out over here, turn sideways, and then go up this way. How's your video, Greg? It's in and out, but I got it now. Okay. I'm gonna come over the top of the tree, and I'm gonna take a walk. The expansive aerial view allows the team to search the area for movement or nests for miles around. It is far more efficient than scouting on foot, but it is not without its challenges. Wind is, wind is definitely buffeting upstairs above the trees. But the video looks good though when I can see it. Good. Bergen struggles to keep the helicopter steady against the force of the wind. After a turbulent but successful run, Bergen brings the chopper in. Now they must wait until darkness to launch the thermal camera. If the grass man does live here, this may be the best way to capture an image of the creature. But according to Don Keating, that image may already exist. Photographic evidence of the Ohio grass man is the goal of this Monster Quest expedition. But according to Don Keating, it may already exist. In August of 1992, Keating received reports of a grass man sighting in an area about an hour from Salt Fork State Park. He went to investigate and brought his video camera along to film the small wilderness area. It was in a area of Coshocton County, Ohio, known as the Woodbury Wildlife Area. I had the camcorder up on my shoulder. Uh, I left it recording. 
Didn't turn it off, didn't pause it. I took probably no more than a half a dozen steps away from the lake, stopped for a second, and then walked back toward the lake. And I didn't know I had captured something on tape for about a year and a half. Keating only discovered the image while searching his tape library for another piece of footage. This thing is walking down this road, this gravel road about 100 yards away from me. Here is what he saw. Notice the area beyond the path near the center of the screen. Once I seen it, I was like, what the heck? You know, hit the rewind button probably 100 times that night to watch it over and over and over again. And uh, it's a very interesting piece of tape. Enlarging the video causes a loss of apparent detail. And the white in the moving object may be due to overexposure in the bright sunlight. To me, it looks like a very, very, very tall individual uh, walking on two legs, uh, walking down the gravel road. You don't know if it's a Bigfoot or not, uh, but it's quite tall and quite fast. Just, I don't know what it is. But Keating would like to find out. Keating has sent the tape to Peter Schmitz of Motion Engineering in Minnesota to have it analyzed. That's what I do filming and recording and analyzing video. Schmitz is an expert in video analysis, and he's using the latest in computer technology to enhance and clarify the image. Well, the first time through, I'll run, let it run through at normal frame rate, uh, 30 hertz, and just to try to get a feel for the overall scene and what's going on, such as the, the wind direction, sun direction, lighting issues. Schmitz then focuses his attention on the 39 frames of video that caught Keating's attention. This area here is where I first started to see motion. Something actually leading what appears to be the creature. The creature will appear in this area. It's coming up here right here. And it's pretty clear that it's an up, upright walking animal and then it disappears into the tree line or behind the, the tree, and we don't see it come back out again after that. Schmitz will need some time to conclude his examination of the video clip. The subject's distance and the quality of the VHS tape will be a challenge. The Keating video holds promise, but Jody Cook believes he may already have physical evidence that grass band lurks in the rural areas of Ohio. As the head of the Ohio Center for Bigfoot Studies, Cook fields about a dozen eyewitness reports a year. In 2002, he received more than just a call. The cast of a print, a handprint, that left behind identifying markers. It was a very unique handprint because it showed a lot of detail, showed a lot of dermal ridges. On February 24, 2002, this print was cast by a hunter in Bentonville, Ohio, about two hours southwest of Columbus. Cook believes the print likely was left by Grassman and has enlisted the expertise of latent fingerprint expert Jimmy Chilcutt. What's unique about my uh, qualifications is not only am I a fingerprint expert, I am a primate fingerprint expert. Chilcutt has been a fingerprint expert for the Conroe, Texas Police Department for over 18 years. Like human prints, primate prints are unique and hard to duplicate. As a result of research early in his career, Chilcutt has created a database of primate prints and is a specialist in this field. And after studying these for several years, uh, you know, I understood or could see the difference between a gorilla's print and a orangutan's print, a monkey's print from a, uh, a baboon from a chimpanzee. Chilcutt should be able to determine if the print is a hoax or from a known primate or from something altogether unknown. My first impression, the flexion crease runs all the way across the hand. In humans, there's always a break. Chilka will be looking for dermal ridges, linear projections of tissue typically found on the surfaces of palms, soles, digits, and sometimes prehensile tails of primates. Like fingerprints, dermal ridges form a unique signature of their owner. He will perform a thorough visual examination, including utilizing lasers to help identify the creature that made the print. Another advanced technology experiment is about to take place in Salt Fork State Park. Chris Bergen and Greg Alderman prepare for a nighttime flight with a low-noise, electric-powered helicopter that will carry a thermal imaging camera. Hopefully the wind will calm down when the sun goes down a little bit more. 
The chopper is equipped with a FLIR thermal imaging camera that employs technology used by Homeland Security and law enforcement to search for suspects on the run. This advanced infrared camera is very sensitive to small variations in temperature. Any object warmer than the temperature of its surrounding environment is detected by the camera and will glow on the monitor. The helicopter itself is outfitted with colored lights to help the pilot orient the aircraft in the dark. On board the helicopter, we have glow rope in two different colors, this being green, the one on the tail boom being blue, so that I can maintain orientation of the helicopter while it's in flight. We'll also have lights in the blades. Two spots, the very tip will be red, the top will be red, and on the bottom will be an orange spot. That'll tell me if the helicopter is right side up or upside down. Let me just verify that it's going to hold the camera. Yeah, that's about all you get aiming down, but that should be more than enough. 30 degree down angle. That's ready. Just need the darkness. The near silent helicopter is ready for launch. The flare may not be able to distinguish between grass man and other animals, but if it finds something, the team can send people into the area to investigate further. This is nice. This is really nice. If there's a Bigfoot out there, this should find him. After performing pre-flight checks, Bergen is ready for liftoff. The thermal camera is connected to an onboard video transmitter, so Keating can observe the infrared image from down on the ground. We're getting a signal here, and um, you can see the operator of the camera and the, uh, the helicopter. And this is what we're hoping to find in the woods, uh, some type of a bipedal signature, something walking around on two legs. Yeah, oh, the image is great. Um, I would love to have some type of this, some type of equipment like this in my arsenal. Surprised we haven't seen any deer yet. I'm sure they're out there. Uh, we've got a, of course, a lot of trees. Uh, we've got, uh, you can see the ground down below with the. Uh, what's that? Wait, wait, wait a second. What's that? Yeah. What's that? As the helicopter passes over a large stand of trees. Bergen's partner notices a heat signature on the monitor. What's my time stamp? Eight minutes. There is enough power left for just a few more minutes of flight. Keating is running out of time. I, I'm down as far as I can go. There we go. Yeah, right yep, there in the, the bottom there. of yep. the screen. Yep, right. Yeah, See what I'm okay, talking yeah. about? Uh -huh. Yeah, I do. I'm not quite sure if it had movement to it or not. What do you think? The heat signature indicates that there is a warm body down there. But what is it? I'm not sure what it is. Monster Quest expedition leader Don Keating is locked in front of the video monitor. He spotted something on the thermal camera video transmission that he can't identify. Could this be evidence of the grass man? There's some kind of a, appears to be an animal down there on the ground. Oops, sorry, I can't get back to it. The helicopter is running out of power, and Bergen has to bring it down. It was something near the ground or at the ground level. It was, it, it showed a definite heat signature. I mean, we were able to see the difference between the trunks of the trees, the, the trunks of bushes, and, um, the ground. The size of the animal is difficult to determine, and Keating believes it is worth further examination. I think yeah, there's a possibility there could be something of interest on there. Having expended the reserve of battery power, Keating will have to wait another night to search from the air again. But having noticed the heat signature, the area on the ground will now be searched. The unpredictable Ohio Spring has left an overnight blanket of white at Salt Fork State Park. And Jody Cook picks up the search in daylight where the thermal camera left off. He will focus his efforts on the ground in the area where the heat signature was recorded. His plan for capturing an image of the grass man involves a more low-tech approach. He will rely on a proven technique for attracting wildlife such as waterfowl and deer, a decoy. While commonly used in wildlife biology, Cook believes this is the first time the method has been applied for this kind of research. If there is, you know, a Bigfoot in this area, 
he may see it, see it possibly as a threat, and come up to it and investigate it to see what it is. Cook has designed the face of the decoy based on reports of sightings in the area. Cook chooses a location 200 yards from the trailhead to set his trap. I picked this spot here because it, it's perfect because it, when it goes down, it looks like there's two trails that kind of go off at a fork here. His plan is to place the head and makeshift body against a tree, surrounded by three trail cameras. Variable spring weather in Ohio takes another turn. With the snowfall increasing, Cook works quickly to get the decoy in place. It's set to go. We're ready. So let's go ahead and get the cameras. Day, night, rain, or even snow. The rapid response Reconyx trail cameras will produce a clear picture of anything that happens by. What this particular camera does, it will take um, three pictures every second in, uh, in a series of threes. Man, that's so wicked from right here. If something ventures into the area, there is little chance it will escape the three cameras. What, what I'm hoping is that we can get them on film uh, through our trail cams. We're, I'm hoping that we can find some type of physical evidence that he is here. Terry John says he doesn't need evidence of Grassman. He and his wife, Treba, saw the creature with their own eyes. It was uh, December 30th, close to midnight. Uh, we was out here, my husband and I, and we were enjoying the evening because it's such a bright light, a night. Kind of a typical evening, uh, nice weather for December. Uh, as I remember it, it was frosty. After a few hours of enjoying each other's company, the two decided it was getting late and packed up to head home. We'd been out here till midnight or so, and so we, we were putting our gear away. I'd made a trip or two to the truck, and uh, the ranger pulled in and asked if, how long we were going to be there, and I said, well, we're letting the fire die down. Just as they were getting ready to leave, Treba spotted something moving near the edge of the field. I was looking out in, in the back area because it was such a bright night out. And that's when I seen the broad-shouldered black thing come up over the ridge. Terry, where's the light? It had to be at least seven, eight feet tall. It just had me shoved over, and by that time, everything was gone. While the creature never got close enough for Treba John to see its face, its sinister presence left her terrified. It's hard to explain to him how it made me feel. I mean, like every nerve in my body was twitching. And then even the smallest hair on my face stood up. That's about how it happened. It was so fast that, I mean, I had nightmares after. No, I'll never forget it. Never forget it. Whether the creature was merely curious or searching for prey is unknown. But sightings such as the Giants suggest simply being out at night is enough to attract Grassman. Researchers Don Keating and Jody Cook intend to find out for themselves. Not far from the location of the previous night's heat signature, the two have built a fire as the Giants did. They will attempt to lure the creature close with a communications technique called wood knocking. Wood knocking is a documented method of communication for primates and has been reported in conjunction with Bigfoot sightings. If a grass man is in the area, Keating and Cook believe the sound will get its attention. What we're going to attempt to do is we're going to do three knocks uh, to try and see if we can get any type of response back. Cook's percussive calls enter the darkness with no reply. Yeah. I figured if we were going to get a response, we would have got it by now. With no response to the wood knocking, Keating attempts a vocalization based on a sound he's heard coming from the woods on more than one occasion. <coughs> Keating hopes his calls tonight will elicit another response. Possibly intimidate something into, into responding back. See if anything responds to it within 15, 30, 60 seconds afterwards.
that's really about it. If, normally, if you don't get anything about 30 seconds afterwards, nothing's gonna respond to you. But Keating believes he got a response to calls he made near this area in 2007 and recorded them on tape. The sounds of the forest make it difficult to hear. With the sound isolated and the volume enhanced, it becomes more audible. Subsequent analysis indicates the sounds Keating recorded cannot be attributed to any animals indigenous to the area. But could they have been made by Grassman? Keating has sent the recordings to primate expert Esteban Sarmiento for review. His analysis of the sounds is inconclusive, but he does confirm that vocalizations among primates is a common occurrence. The noise that I give off as a human or a primate identifies my locale, my area in three-dimensional space. If you have a lot of calling associated, it's telling you it's a social animal. It's an animal that just doesn't want to interact with you, but it wants to interact with others. While these vocalizations have been attributed to Ohio's grass man, it is impossible to prove that the creature did indeed make the sounds. But could this handprint left in the soil near Bentonville, Ohio, prove the existence of grass man? I can tell you positively that this is a non-human primate. In the rural and rugged land of eastern Ohio, residents claim to see a huge, hairy creature seven to eight feet tall with large hands and feet. Its name, Grassman. While finishing up his route near Salt Fork State Park, delivery truck driver Rich LaMonica drove by something that captured his attention. As I was uh, taking the straightaway, uh, about halfway through the straightaway is when I noticed a creature, or whatever it was, uh, going through the woods. I couldn't see if it had hair on it, but it was definitely uh, black or a very, very dark brown from head to toe. LaMonica quickly pulled his truck over. I hopped down and uh, ran back to see if I could glimpse it any further. Uh, it, it was huge. It was absolutely wide and huge. Because of the, uh, the outline of the, the snow and no trees and no leaves, I was able to see it very well, in fact. But within seconds, the creature disappeared into the woods. I looked around, uh, but I didn't see anything moving. And because I, do, I was scheduled to make deliveries, I had to, couldn't stay too long. So I had to get back in my truck and get going again. But Bigfoot in Ohio is a very possible thing. And uh, like I say, what I saw, I would have to put into that category. While eyewitness reports of Grassman are difficult, if not impossible to verify, the creature may have left a unique clue to its identity. Latent fingerprint expert Jimmy Chilcutt is in the process of examining this handprint that some believe may belong to the creature. Chilcutt immediately rules out the possibility of a human handprint. It's a non-human primate due to the Simeon crease right here. Let's see if we got him. It's um, the core of this index fingerprint is way low. So it's got to be non human primate. I'm nearly positive it's non human primate. It looks more like a gorilla than a chimpanzee because of the, the length of the fingers. They're real stubby and fat, whereas a chimp's a little bit longer. We got a good ridge pattern or fingerprint pattern here on the index finger. Well, I believe that this is going to need some side lighting to enhance these the ridge detail that's on the fingers. Chilcutt uses a laser to reveal even more information. What I'm using is an Omnichrome 1000 alternate light source. I've got it set on the 530 nanometers wavelength, and what this does it adds cross lighting to the friction ridges, which makes the, the valleys and the, the ridges stand out a lot more. All right, this is a good clear loop. You can see the innermost recurve, or this is called the core. And notice how close the core is to the first joint. And that is consistent with non-human primates. Whatever this casting is, I can tell you with 100% accuracy that it, it came from a real animal. 
Further analysis will be required for Chilcot to determine just what animal was responsible for the handprint. Jody Cook wants to determine what animal could be responsible for building the huge nest he found near Akron, Ohio. Was it Grassman? Could it be a child's fort? Or was it built by some other creature? Cook hopes to find out by seeing how difficult it would be to recreate the intricate structure himself. We're not going to use any rope, any tape, anything like that. We're just going to use Mother Nature itself to uh, build this with. Cook has asked fellow Bigfoot researcher Bob Lebo to assist him in making the nest. What we'll need to do first is build a actual frame. Well, I like to get a lot of uh, the smaller stuff because I want to leave like that. Yeah, an opening here to be an opening. Yeah, a lot more of this brush here would be really, really good, Bob. As much as you can get with the pines on it would, uh, is what we need. With the nest construction taking more effort than he anticipated, Cook is certain the original structure was not made by children. It's a little bit more difficult uh, than I actually thought it would be. And after working for over an hour, the structure is merely a skeleton of the nest that Cook found. It, it definitely would take a lot of time uh, to definitely build something uh, to the magnitude of what we have found. The experiment leaves Cook with more questions than answers about what or who may have built the nest. Questions he hopes this expert can answer. Liz Cuthbert is a zookeeper with the Como Park Zoo in St. Paul, Minnesota. She has experience working with a wide range of animals and has agreed to analyze the photos. Well, both gorillas and orangutans do make nests. Not terribly intricate. They'll grab some leaves, whatever is nearby, some brush, just to make a comfortable mattress you might want to call it, to sleep on. In this type of habitat, you'd probably see fox, coyotes. They wouldn't be building any type of a nest, especially to that size. I can't imagine what, what in nature would build something like that. Cook's experiment proves inconclusive. Who or what built the nests remains a mystery. Cook turns his attention to his trail cameras, hoping they'll provide more definitive proof. We're going to check the cameras, see how many pictures are on there, see if we got anything. Cook gets to work on taking down the decoy and cameras. He needs to move quickly. There are reports of another storm heading in. This one is bringing rain. Let's see what we got here. OK, we'll go ahead and turn them off. Get that one turned off, and we'll go ahead and get these other ones turned off here real quick. All right, this one had a series of uh, 36. So we'll go ahead and get that one off. Hopefully we did get something on film. OK, it took a series of 49 different sets of pictures, 50 right now. So um, obviously there have you know, definitely been some movement. creature that locals call the Grassman is said to be roaming eastern Ohio. Sightings dating back to the early 1800s suggest a large, muscular creature with hands and feet to match may be roaming the thick and rolling hillsides. This woman says she saw it out her bedroom window. This woman says it watched her from the edge of the field. And both of these Bigfoot researchers claim to have seen it. While eyewitness reports can be subjective, evidence is able to be analyzed and studied. Latent fingerprint expert Jimmy Chilcutt has determined that the handprint cast in Bentonville, Ohio, belongs to a non-human primate. But what kind of primate? In a chimpanzee, the fingers are a lot longer. Now, if you'll notice in this picture that the gorilla handprint, you'll notice the stubbiness of the fingers, which is consistent with this cast. So even though I can't say positively sure this is a, the palm print of a gorilla or the handprint of a gorilla, it is more consistent with a gorilla. 
Chilcutt cannot rule out that the handprint may belong to Grassman. Whatever it is, it appears to be authentic. Monster Quest is seeking to provide some answers as a team of researchers focus their efforts within a region of Ohio known as the Sasquatch Triangle. Let's get this thing out here and get some night shots. Expedition leader Don Keating is hoping tonight they will capture visual evidence as he and Chris Bergen prepare to send the helicopter up again. This location's a little tighter than where we were at before uh, with the, the surrounding area of trees. As Chris Bergen makes final preparations for flight, Keating positions himself at the monitor. We're gonna do a vertical takeoff up above the tree line and just do a pirouette around the area, seeing if there's anything to see. Might be a little difficult, it'll be a little hairy, but uh, shouldn't be too bad. Helicopter's flying perfect, knock on wood. Um, no problem so far. Okay. Got a good signal, but we're not seeing anything of any interest. With power getting low, Bergen brings the helicopter in. Unfortunately, we didn't find anything of any interest. Overall, I would say it was a, it was a good attempt uh, on, on both locations. I'm still intrigued, going back through my mind and looking at you know looking at what we've seen on the uh, monitor there for about 10 or 15 seconds at what. Uh, but was back at location number one uh, up in the woods. The next day, an approaching storm makes the chances of another flight unlikely. Well, unfortunately, today uh, we've got some good rain coming. The uh, the helicopter can certainly fly in the rain, and I can protect the transmitter. The problem is the the camera. We're at, uh, we'll get a lot of moisture on the lens, so we wouldn't get a very good picture. With a heavy rainstorm canceling the rest of the expedition, Keating's best chance for substantiating Grassman's existence lies with the video he shot in 1992. Peter Schmitz of Motion Engineering in Minnesota has been analyzing the video frame by frame to isolate the image. Now we're dropping it down to 25% of the original playback speed. In some situations, slowing the video down helps the human eye catch up to what's going on. As we zoom in, it becomes so pixelated that you've only got a few pixels there to try to identify what it is that you're seeing. And it just becomes too pixelated for us to be able to identify. You're looking at uh, eight or 10 pixels there, and there's just not enough, enough information in eight or 10 pixels to really bring out the, the detail. Unfortunately, slowing the video down and zooming in doesn't give Schmitz a clear picture. Uh, when it becomes this pixelated, no. It's just a blob, a blob moving across the screen. All you can tell is that there's some, there's some movement there. Because of the quality of the VHS video, Schmitz is unable to come to a clear conclusion. The video quality was not high enough quality for me to really do a whole lot of work with it. It was nondescript. There was, there was not enough information there to really identify what it is that we were looking at. Um, it did look like an upright walking creature, but anything more than that, it was, there was not enough information there to identify it. What of Cook's trail cameras, specifically designed to capture an image with an abundance of detail? As the photos upload onto his computer, Cook is anxious to have a look. Right now I'm looking at some night shots. Um, probably the cameras uh, activated as we were coming down. The quality, um, very good. So far, uh, I don't see anything that uh, looks as like if uh, it came across any of the cameras. With Monster Quest's search for Grassman coming to an end, questions remain. Just what are eyewitnesses seeing in America's heartland? I mean, when I first started doing this, I was skeptical. And I would still be skeptical to today if I hadn't seen it myself. And could this be a photo of a grassman nest? They have had sightings of the grassman in that particular area, you know, next to this dome. And what of this handprint found in Bentonville, Ohio? If it's a Sasquatch print, I'm not shocked. If it's a gorilla print, I'm not shocked. The question is, how did it get there? In the most remote areas of the world, 
something massive is silently stalking its victims and swallowing them whole. They cut it open, and soon enough, they found the little girl in the stomach of the snake. History supports the existence of snakes larger than anyone imagined. A 30-foot python probably has the ability to open its mouth two to three feet wide. This would lead you to believe that, yes, it could swallow an adult human being. Now, using the latest technology, science explores the wilderness. Oh, wow, there's a big guy right here, right ahead of us, right there. And uncovers evidence much closer to home. Hold on, there's one. An expedition searches for proof and uncovers some surprises. He's got me. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. This is the Republic of Venezuela. The rugged grasslands here teem with monkeys, giant anteaters, and the world's largest rodents called capybaras. Lurking beneath the surface of these rivers are ferocious predators like crocodiles and piranhas. But the people here say something even bigger and more deadly is out there. Legendary, monster-sized anacondas. And they are becoming its prey. He's saying that that was 40 to 50 meters long. He had my whole hand in his mouth. The snake pulled me down to the ground, so I was just trying to get my hand back. The girl was lost. No one could find her. The snake had already swallowed her. Anacondas are some of nature's most vicious predators, equipped with razor-sharp teeth and powerful muscles to crush their prey. The teeth of the anaconda are like needles that curve backwards. If you try to pull out, they go in even further, deeper. And then it throws a couple loops and starts squeezing incredibly powerfully. The prey is trying to get its breath, and with every breath, those toils just tighten up even more until cardiac arrest. Here, you can see an anaconda making a meal of a capybara. The snake squeezes the animal, then swallows it whole. Eyewitness reports from around the world describe monster snakes reaching nearly 150 feet, or half a football field in length. These giants could be anacondas or pythons, two of the largest snake species in the world. Unlike other snake species, which kill their prey with poisonous venom, pythons and anacondas are constrictors, snakes that squeeze their prey to death. Pythons are native to Asia and Africa, anacondas to South America. No one has ever produced hard evidence of a python or anaconda longer than 30 feet. Monster Quest is sending biologist Jesus Rivas deep into Venezuela to hunt for just such a giant, an anaconda bigger than any found before. He's flown from Caracas, the Venezuelan capital, to the town of Barinas. From here, it's a three-hour drive into the Llanos. Los Llanos, in Spanish, means plains. It is a 200,000 square mile swath of wild savanna. The largest anaconda I found was about 17, 18 feet long. However, there have been a couple of stories people have told me that refer to a very large snake, probably much larger than anyone that I have caught. And I had no reason to disbelieve this story. The first stop on Rivas' expedition is here the tiny town of Monte Carlo. It's the final outpost before leaving civilization behind. He's looking for clues from the locals about what they've seen. And he's led to this man. He just told me a story actually quite a remarkable, something that happened to his cousin 35 years ago. The man claims that his 13-year-old cousin had gone down to the local river alone. An anaconda approached. 
In the water, the snake was all but invisible. Without warning, it attacked. The anaconda wrapped its massive coils around the girl. There was no chance of escape. The snake squeezed the girl to death, then proceeded to swallow her whole. They found her, they killed it, they cut it open, and sure enough, they found the little girl uh, in the stomach of the snake. That was the largest snake I had ever seen. It was at least 45 feet long. 45 feet is a giant snake, and it's just what Rivas is looking for. From this town, it's an hour's drive to this remote ranch called El Sidra. This will be Rivas's base of operations. Because anacondas can thrive on both land and in water, Rivas has a plan to search both for the elusive giant snake. He's pioneered a low-tech but daring technique to search for these predators, feeling for them with his bare feet. He'll also be armed with motion-triggered cameras and the latest military-grade sonar to help him peer into deeper waters. Existing evidence of giant snakes is sparse. One of the earliest and most famous accounts comes from British explorer Percy Fawcett, who in 1907 says he encountered a 62-foot anaconda in Brazil. Later expeditions came back with fantastic stories of killer snakes. But more recently, this series of photographs surfaced on the internet. They appear to show a man swallowed whole by a giant python. But are these photos hoaxes or real evidence of giant man-eating snakes? Experts will analyze this evidence. If you look at the ribs, they are facing towards the back, and that would be consistent with the snake swallowing towards the tail. The pythons in these photos are native to Asia and Africa. But there could be thousands of them right here in the United States, specifically in the Everglades of South Florida. This will be the site of another Monster Quest expedition. With more than one and a half million acres of wilderness, this is a perfect hiding place for giant snakes, as seen in these shocking pictures taken in 2005. You can see a 13-foot Burmese python split almost in two after swallowing an alligator whole. On the upper right is the snake's head. On the left, its tail. The alligator's tail protrudes from the snake's ruptured belly. To look at an animal, for instance, like a python feeding on an alligator that it would not find in its normal habitat shows that the animal would adapt to what's available to it. A snake's digestive systems are incredible. They can digest almost anything and evidence suggests that these eating machines are on the move. This is also a Burmese python, and it's invaded this man's suburban Miami backyard. His struggle with it was captured by a local news crew. Fearing for his exotic fish, the owner and a friend jumping into action, trying to pounce on the python, but charming this snake didn't go so well. It was no isolated incident. Just a few days earlier, this python was discovered nearby with a swollen belly, what turned out to be a 15-pound pet cat named Francis. These incidents are becoming so common that Miami-Dade County now has an emergency unit to respond to such calls. It's called the Anti-Venom Unit. This is a big problem here in South Florida. And these are big snakes that can hurt a young child as well as a teenage boy or even a full-grown adult. Handling these snakes is dangerous, even for professionals. 
How did pythons native to Southeast Asia end up in these Miami neighborhoods? For many years now, these snakes have been very popular pets. Ron McGill of the Miami Metro Zoo has been studying Florida wildlife for nearly 30 years. The unfortunate thing is they purchase these animals when they're hatchlings or newborns in pet shops and they look very manageable. But when pythons get too big for their cages, owners release them into the Everglades. And in 1992, when Hurricane Andrew hit here, destroying homes and pet stores, hundreds of young pythons escaped into the wild. Nobody could have predicted what happened next. Because of our climate, it's so conducive to these animals, when they are released or they escape, that they thrive. Not only do they thrive, they reproduce. Just how many pythons are now living in the Everglades is unknown. But there's no question the number is growing. A large constrictor can have 50 to 60 live babies that are on their own. So really, I don't see a way short of a long, deep freeze in South Florida where these animals are going to be eradicated. McGill has evidence that this new population of snakes are about to become giants. This is a 20-foot skin of a reticulated python that washed up on a beach in Miami, an animal that started out as a pet, but now is indicative of a problem that we're experiencing here in South Florida. And the South Florida environment is extremely conducive to the growth of these snakes. It's a warm, human environment, has incredible prey base, whether it be raccoons, possums, waterfowl, uh, and quite supportive for snakes reaching maximum size. The implications to people here in Florida could be lethal. A snake this size in a residential area can pretty much prey on anything he wants. Th this snake could kill me that fast if it wanted to. Wildlife biologist Joe Wazalewski is no stranger to giant snakes. In 1989, he helped capture this 22-foot python, the biggest snake ever found in the United States. Now he's going to lead a hunt here in Florida to find a giant even bigger than that. Wazalewski believes that giant snakes are thriving in the Everglades and may start crossing into residential areas. Now he's looking for evidence. But snakes, even giant ones, are elusive. First, he will set up motion sensing cameras. You know, this is actually perfect. If I were to be a python in this neighborhood, this is where I'd want to be. Nice shaded, houses all over, Everglades right there. This could be the spot. The place he's chosen is the border between the Everglades National Park and the densely populated suburbs south of Miami. They'll be going from point A to point B. And if there's any movement in front of this camera, it will catch it. Now he'll drive along this boundary in search of evidence that full-grown pythons, upwards of 20 feet, are in fact leaving the Everglades and invading these neighborhoods. If the pythons are in the Everglades, it's just a matter of crossing a road to get in to these urban areas. Will Wazalewski find the giant snake he's looking for? Yeah, wait, hold on, there's one. In South Florida, there are signs that dozens of neighborhoods around Miami could be under attack from giant killer snakes. Experts pointed these photos as evidence. They were taken by a wildlife researcher in the Everglades in 2005. They show a 13-foot Burmese python, which appears to have burst open after swallowing a six-foot alligator whole. Snakes' digestive systems are incredible. They can digest almost anything. People are speculating, well, that the python just exploded because the alligator was too big. That's really not the case at all. What most likely happened is that this alligator was swallowed Either a claw or a tooth or something caused some type of perforation in the python's gut, caused an infection which led to the death of the snake. If pythons are growing large enough to swallow alligators whole, then they could be a threat to people living nearby. A python that gets to any of significant size in a place like the Everglades will feed on any warm-blooded mammal of any size that it can kill and swallow. They can adapt, they can branch out, they can be found in suburban areas. A 2007 U.S. Geological Survey reports that as the Earth continues to warm, the python's habitat could start to expand and eventually stretch from New Jersey to California. 
Joe Wazalewski thinks that's happening already. We really could be on the verge of a real epidemic with these pythons. Just because you don't see them does not necessarily mean they're not here. What it does mean is they're hiding pretty good on us. It's been dry for the last few months. Up until a couple nights ago, we got some really good rains. And with the rains coming in, it sort of wakes all the wildlife up. Right now is the perfect time to look for pythons. A thousand miles away in Venezuela, anaconda expert Jesus Rivas is about to begin his search for a giant snake. This region of South America is a hotbed for giant snake sightings. From neighboring Brazil came one of history's most widely sighted encounters. It came from this man, Colonel Percy Fawcett. On January 7, 1907, Fawcett was on assignment with Britain's Royal Geographical Society. He described the encounter in his journal. We were drifting easily along in the sluggish current when there appeared a triangular head in several feet of undulating body. It was a giant anaconda. I sprang from my rifle and, hardly waiting to aim, smashed a 44 soft soft-nosed bullet into its spine. We stepped ashore and approached the reptile with caution. As far as it was possible to measure, a length of 45 feet lay out of the water and 17 feet in it, making a total length of 62 feet. This drawing and Fawcett's account are the only existing evidence of this giant snake. In his search for new evidence, Jesus Rivas will use cutting edge sonar imaging technology originally designed for the U.S. Navy to detect suspicious divers in restricted waters. The device is called the Ditson, or Dual Frequency Identification Sonar. Ed Belcher and his team at Soundmetrics in Seattle, Washington, designed this device. This is an acoustic camera. It uses sound instead of light to generate an image. Rivas will encounter zero visibility conditions in his search for a giant anaconda. This device will be his eyes underwater. Belcher places a brick in the tank and clouds the water to demonstrate the Ditson's imaging capabilities. To the naked eye, the brick is invisible. But the Ditson sees it clearly. Now, this brick is only about four feet away. But in Venezuela, while you're looking for snakes, they'll be probably 30, 40 feet away, and we'll still be able to see those snakes. Once Rivas finds a snake, he'll be able to measure it to see if he's found an actual giant. Sonar has never been used before to search for giant snakes. And what Rivas finds could raise the evidentiary bar. Joining Rivas on his expedition are his old partners, Victor and Ramon. They'll be setting motion-triggered camera traps, but they must first track down bait to lure the giant snakes. For that, they'll need to collect musk from another anaconda. Musk is a mysterious glandular excretion that Rivas believes could attract other snakes. Nobody knows what the musk is for. It could be for defense, because it's very stinky, but also it could have a social function, attraction. Ahead, something in the road catches their eye. It's the track of an anaconda. I can see the print of the scales here. Dirt in this side tells me the snake is going that way. And because of that print size, I can tell this snake was about eight to nine feet long. When I see a track this fresh, I know it's only an hour or two old. So this anaconda has to be nearby. Anacondas inhabit shallow swamps where they stalk their prey. Five years ago, this particular swamp was the site of a near fatal attack. This man, Jose de Esteban, is a cowboy at El Cidral, the same ranch where Rivas is based. He is one of the few locals to tangle with an anaconda and live to tell about it. 
De Esteban had heard a report of a large anaconda by the roadside and went to investigate. I was out there looking for one, and I saw it on the ground. And without even thinking, I bent out to see it closer, and before I knew it, it got me. De Esteban struggled to keep the anaconda's coils from wrapping around his body. After nearly five minutes, he finally wrestled himself free. The team begins their search in the same swamp where De Esteban was attacked. They can't see them, but they know that anacondas are here. In their hunt, they use only poles and their bare feet. Rivas's unorthodox methods have earned him the nickname the barefoot biologist. As he searches, his only safety net is his instinct and experience. This water is not very deep. If I catch an anaconda in a water that is too deep, she might have the upper hand. I don't want that. This is snake here, not a very big one. There's another one right here. Ramon! Victor! These anacondas are too small for musk extraction. But there's evidence that a bigger anaconda could be nearby. So this is a crack right here. It seems like this anaconda will be about 9, 10 feet, maybe that big around. Despite the fresh trail, Rivas cannot find the snake. The team is losing daylight. The pressure is on. Rivas discovers something. But it's not an anaconda. Not a snake. Nobody went to find. It's a small but very unhappy crocodile. The day seems all but over. But then, a discovery. Oh, it's very strong for a small snake. Now, this baby is actually putting the squeeze on my arm now. If it's any harder, I wouldn't be able to withstand it. This feisty That's anaconda it. is just right for Rivas to extract its musk. At first light, the team will set the camera traps and test the sonar. I can see how fat he is. And in Florida, a Monster Quest demonstration goes terribly wrong. He's got me. Snakes have been the object of fascination and worship throughout history. From the pharaoh's tombs of ancient Egypt, to Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god of the Aztecs, to the Naga, a mythical river serpent in the Mekong Delta of Southeast Asia. Two million snakes are the embodiment of evil and a source of paralyzing fear. That fear is very real in Venezuela and in Florida, where there could be evidence of giant pythons and anacondas. And two expeditions are underway to find them. In South Florida, the investigation is tracking escaped pet pythons that have for years been thriving and growing in the seclusion of the Everglades. But there are signs that they're now invading suburban neighborhoods. Captain Ernie Jolson with Miami-Dade's anti-venom unit has seen it firsthand. I've been doing this for nine and a half years, and we're getting more and more of these calls for recoveries every year. We foresee in the future that we will definitely see larger snakes, more calls on these larger constrictors than we have in the past. Come back, come back, come back around. The calls that we are receiving, they are a lot of large constrictors, 7 to 10 to 12 foot long. This year, I expect it to get worse. Captain Jilson and his partner, Captain Chuck Seifert, agreed to demonstrate for Monster Quest how they capture these deadly predators. This is a 10-foot python 
caught on a recent call, and it's not happy. They try to subdue it by covering its head with this bag. But this python is intent on escape. They need to act fast. He's pissed at me. And as a last resort, Jilson abandons his tools for his bare hands. Maybe I can get him to chill. He needs to sneak up behind the snake, then grab it right below its head to stay clear of its jaws. I'm gonna walk around this way, since he's fixated there, come from behind him and grab him. He's got me. The snake bites Jilson, clamping down on his wrist. He has no way to break free. He's got a good hold on me. Can you push it in a little bit? No. Nope. Oh, he's got the vein, dude. The snake is coiling around their bodies. Seaford has to use brute force to pry the jaws open, tearing the skin from Jilson's wrist. Yep. Ah, oh, he got me good, dude. Go get an ace. Ah. Yep. Yeah, it hurts like heck right now. They got real sharp teeth. As I approached him, my mistake was I didn't grab him close enough to his head. When I did grab, I slid back and he was able to circle around. He came back on me and bit me in the arm. And as you can see, they got a full mouth of teeth. He got me with his inner and his outer teeth. As Jilson discovered, a constrictor's jaws are one of nature's deadliest contraptions. Both pythons and anacondas have six rows of razor-sharp teeth that curve backwards like a hundred individual fish hooks. The more the prey struggles, the deeper the teeth sink into its flesh. This snake was 10 feet long, hardly a giant. But if it was a giant, could it have killed and swallowed Jilson whole? Yeah! Monster Quest has compiled this photographic evidence from the internet that suggests it could be possible. No one has come forward to say where and when these pictures were taken but many are convinced that they are evidence of giant man-eating snakes. Now Bob Henderson and Ron McGill analyze this evidence. In looking at this image, if you look at the ribs, they are facing towards the back, and that would be consistent with the snake swallowing from the head being this way towards the tail. As demonstrated here with this python feeding on a dead rabbit, the head is the most compact and manageable part of the body for a snake to get its jaws around. That's why snakes always swallow head first. The same would be true for a human victim. Now what allows the snake to open its mouth very widely are special bones that it has back here. It's called a quadrate bone. The quadrate bone at the back of the skull allows the jaws of the snake to drop straight down to open unusually wide. Then the separation between the two bottom jaw bones allows the mouth to expand even further, to three times the width of its own head. But Henderson isn't sure the snake in this photo has swallowed a person. It's based on the size of the, the person and the fact that it doesn't seem to have any particular bruising or anything like that. Everything looks just very, very much intact for it to have been the victim of a snake attack and to have been ingested by a large snake. A snake swallowing its prey is a slow but violent process. A snake has no limbs to push food into its mouth. Instead, it has rows of curved teeth that move independently, pulling the prey little by little into its stomach. The condition of this body appears inconsistent with that of a snake's victim. While we can't definitively say that it's a forgery, it does give us pause. This photograph, however, seems to tell a different story. Now, this photograph here is more indicative of what I think could easily happen. If this is the shoulder here and the arm here, this would have to be the head. This photo was taken in 1995 by a policeman in Malaysia. He claims it shows a man lying face down with a giant snake coiled around his body. 
his head in its mouth. I think the snake could have a real hard time getting around uh, what looked like they might be fairly broad shoulders. Prey species would bleed a lot from those wounds. And here you see that this snake has struggled. It has tried to go back and forth, trying to get over those shoulders, which is spreading this blood, spreading this injury. Once the snake swallows this man's head, the shoulders could prove to be an insurmountable obstacle. The average width of an adult's shoulders is about two feet. But if the snake could get its mouth around the shoulders, nothing could stop it from swallowing a person whole. A 30-foot python probably has the ability to open its mouth in two to three feet wide. This would lead you to believe that, yes, it could swallow an adult human being. The best place to find these monster-sized snakes is going to be in the remotest areas of the world. Back in Venezuela, Rivas extracts the musk of the anaconda he caught the night before. He believes the musk could contain pheromones that will attract other anacondas, hopefully a giant. So maybe if this musk has a social function, with the camera traps, we might be able to find bigger, better, more anacondas. Rivas positions and aims the cameras using the onboard laser sight. Each is equipped with a motion-sensing trigger and a flash. These cameras will capture whatever crosses their path, day or night. Now the team will test the sonar. Cool. I can see him. I can see his arms, his feet. I can see how fat he is. Let me measure how fat he is. Almost half a meter. Have to lose some weight, buddy. After the tests, Rivas heads into the field. This will be the first time such technology has ever been used to hunt for anacondas, and it could lead these researchers to the discovery of a lifetime. The biggest snake Rivas has found here was 17 feet. Could an even bigger anaconda, a giant, be lurking beneath these waters? Oh, this has something there right in front of us. That looks like a snake. Look, look, aguantalo, aguantalo. It really looks like a snake down here. Around the world, legends are told of giant snakes measuring 150 feet or more, half the length of a football field. Anaconda expert Jesus Rivas and his team are on the hunt for just such a monster snake in Venezuela. On land, they baited and set motion-sensing camera traps. Their search now moves to the water. If an anaconda grows to be too large, it will be limited to deeper water. That's why I think that in these places, I might be able to find larger animals. Visibility under this water is almost zero. But here, the Ditson sonar sees everything. Oh, there's are fishes. A whole bunch of fishes, look. All right, piranhas. Then something much bigger appears on the sonar. There's some shadow here. And I see the bubbles right in front of me when trying to sit under the water with the sonar. What Riva sees is the outline of a crocodile and it's huge. I can actually measure how big it is. It shows now about three and a half meters long. That is 14, 15 feet long. Big girl. Rivas continues his search for a giant snake. If he finds one, he may have to jump in to catch it. The water is anywhere, I'm thinking, about my chest. It might not be very wise of me to get in the water. If the water is shallower, then I might have to give it a go. Suddenly, a promising shape appears on the sonar screen. This has something there right in front of us. Ooh, that looks like a snake. Look, look. Rivas abandons the sonar to search for the snake by hand but he can't feel it. What Rivas saw on the sonar was the dense aquatic vegetation on the river bottom. 
not a giant snake. The sun is setting, but he is undeterred. Like the sonar, anacondas can see in the dark, and they will remain active throughout the night. Back in South Florida, where the search for a giant snake continues, the day is also coming to an end. But that could be good news for biologist Joe Wazalewski. As the sun goes down, and the roads stay warmer, the, the snakes, pythons in this case, will begin to migrate across. And that's usually when they move, is uh, right after sunset and into the night. His search begins to look even more promising. This really is a good road. It, it's sort of secluded. There's a little bit of an orchard here. There's some nurseries, there's homes. And um, this is really perfect to find a python. His intuition is right. There you go. I think I see something. Yeah, wait. Hold on, there's one. Wasilewski finds a wild python that most likely escaped from the Everglades. Oh, yeah. I got it. Well, well, that's the one. It's about eight feet long and about as mean as a python can be. I'll tell you what, if, if this were one 15, 20, 25 feet in length, there's no way I could get it off. It, the, the power of these animals is just absolutely amazing. Out of the Everglades and into this residential area, this python could prove deadly to anybody it encountered. If this one were to coil around someone's neck, this snake could actually choke off your trachea and your esophagus and you could not breathe. Believe it or not, a snake this size. The escalating presence of snakes this size could mean there are even bigger snakes migrating out of the Everglades. The big ones are out there. There's no question about it. But your chances are, if you see a python, it's going to be one around this size, simply because of the numbers game. There's hundreds of this size to one or two huge ones. We think it's a young population. And in the next few years is when they're going to start getting to these really massive sizes. But could be right now, we could see a big one tonight, tomorrow. A storm rolls in, and the rain puts a halt to Wasilewski's search. But the camera traps he said earlier could provide what he's hoping for, evidence of a giant snake in these neighborhoods. And back in Venezuela, Rivas presses on through the night and is startled by what he sees next. Oh, wow, there's a big guy right here, right, he right ahead of us, right there. Could this be their giant? In the wild plains of Venezuela and in these South Florida suburbs, evidence of giant snakes exists. In Venezuela, this cowboy narrowly escaped with his life. And this man says his 13-year-old cousin was swallowed whole by a 45-foot anaconda. In Florida, escape pythons are invading neighborhoods, feeding on pets, even taking on the authorities sent to capture them. So far, no one's ever been killed here by one of these escaped pythons. However, these photographs prove they've become giants, large enough to swallow alligators whole. And these photographs, widely circulated on the internet, could be evidence that they are man-eaters. Although they can't be authenticated, experts agree, it could have happened. I think of a 30-foot constrictor, an anaconda, a python did exist, and it did come across a human being, and it was hungry. There'd be nothing that would stop it from, from swallowing that human being. History is filled with accounts of giant snakes, some over 150 feet in length. Can science now prove the existence of such a snake? 
In the wilds of Venezuela, motion sensing cameras are keeping watch on land. And by the light of the full moon, Jesus Rivas continues his search of the waters. Anacondas are very patient animals. If you want to deal with them, you just need to be just as patient as they are. Even in the pitch black waters, the state of the art sonar sees everything. Rivas is hoping for a glimpse of the snake's distinctive coils. And he gets one. Oh, wow, there's a big guy right here, right, right ahead of us. Victor, check this out. Check this out. This really looks like an anaconda right here, right in this patch of vegetation. Check the highway. Is this a giant anaconda? Victor, aguanta, aguanta. This is a really big thing right there. That is a big guy. No hay nada, pura boda. But the shape disappears into the dense underwater vegetation. The team combs this section of the river again, Por allá. but can't find the no snake. Nada. Busca nada. No hay nada. But there is hope. The sonar has recorded the entire search. And back at the ranch, Rivas can now analyze the footage. He'll also be able to review any still pictures from the motion sensing cameras. This was seem like it took a lot of pictures. The memory cards on the cameras are full. But windblown leaves, birds, and capybaras are all that set them off. Not any snake, not any of the things I was looking for. But the sonar images could prove to be promising. It's a mysterious shadow. It looks like a curl about five feet across. It would be a big snake, but I can't really make out what it is. A snake five feet across would truly be a giant. But what Riva sees is just an illusion on the river bottom. See, the aquatic vegetation really resembled anacondas. Many times I saw something, and when I checked it out in person, there wasn't anything. Rivas remains convinced the eyewitness reports here are true, and he'll be back to search again. I have heard a few stories that I have no reason to disbelieve, and they all report anacondas significantly larger than what I have caught. So whether they can grow larger, yes, I believe it's possible. I would love to see it. There's one. Back in Florida, Joe Wasilewski captured this eight-foot-long python in a residential neighborhood. Now, for the first time, he'll check his motion-sensing cameras for evidence of even bigger pythons leaving the Everglades behind. OK, let's see what we got here. Oh, there's the dog. So the camera does work. Whoa, look at that. There, there. Wait a minute, that's the whole snake. Wow. Now that is a great shot. There's the head, the tail. That thing is at least 12 feet long. This odd looking snake is an albino python, a popular breed with pet owners. It's not a giant, but what Wazalewski has found is new evidence that wild pythons are crossing into suburban neighborhoods. A photo is worth a thousand words, right? And here it is. So that's a fact. Snakes are coming into these areas. And it may be only a matter of time until these snakes become giants. I'll bet in another five, 10 years, we will start seeing the huge ones coming out. The evidence shows giant snakes are an unstoppable force of nature and potential man-eaters. In the Venezuelan Llanos, life goes on as the anacondas lay in wait for their next victim. And here in the US, the population of escaped pythons continues to grow and spread to new areas every day. The next place one turns up could be your own backyard.